broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hey everyone, it's Dr. Dan Ritchie, president of the Functional Aging Institute, and excited for today's webinar with Denise Medved, Out with the Old and In with the New, Changing Your Training Approach to Include Brain Health and Cognitive Function. Now, Denise is the founder, uh, innovator, creator, uh, behind Ageless Grace, uh, which is a brain fitness program with really the purpose of changing the model of aging in this world, which is one of the reasons we love her so much and her content, because that's really what we're about here at the Functional Aging Institute. Um, she has done a lot of stuff uh, over the years across the industry. I'll probably let her share some of that, but just wanted to share some of her personal background in this. Uh, as her parents began to age, it became obvious that her father was aging with ease while her mother was in a relentless cycle of pain. Um, he had a brief illness and died peacefully, uh, really uh, sort of the model of what we want, a full participant in life. Denise's mother, however, suffered from rheumatoid and osteoarthritis, began using a cane and a walker uh, as early as her 50s, and eventually was diagnosed with dementia and Alzheimer's, something that... Uh, obviously impacted Denise's life and, and probably why Ageless Grace even exists today. So Denise, we're really uh, thankful for your passion in this area and, and so glad that you're willing to give us a, an hour of your time today. So please take it away. Well, hello everyone. Can everyone hear me okay? Can you hear me, Dan? Yeah, I hear you just great, and I see your Perfect. screen. See and your... you see my screen. Yep. Terrific. Well, then, uh, welcome to everyone uh, for this presentation of Out with the Old and In with the New. And, of course, it was inspired by the fact that we're still in the first quarter of the year, believe it or not. Uh, and it's a, it's a new year. And what we're talking about is how to change your training approach to include brain health and cognitive function. And by training approach, I mean two different things. I know that many of you on this webinar... Um, are uh, functional aging specialists, and many of you are personal trainers. Some of you teach other kinds of fitness programs like Ageless Grace, uh, Brain Health Program. And so when I say your training approach, I mean your training approach for yourself as well as your training approach for any clients or students that you may have. Um, we're talking about the my program, which is Ageless Grace Brain Health, and it's a cutting-edge brain body fitness program, and it's based on two things, neuroscience and play, um, and the reality is it's never too late to begin, and it's never too early to start thinking about including cognitive health and function in your life. A lot of people like to say, oh, I don't need that yet. I, you know, I'm not there yet. I haven't started losing my memory. I'm not confused. Well, it's kind of like brushing your teeth. You don't want to wait until, you know, you have a whole mouthful of cavities to start brushing your teeth. And neither do you want to wait until suddenly you're noticing memory loss and cognitive function decline to do something about it. The ideal situation would be for children to know and understand how they can create brain health and then stimulate neuroplasticity in their lives and begin doing that then. However, there are all kinds of studies that show even if you begin doing cognitive exercises and include that in your personal training, as late as in your 80s or 90s, you can still see improvement and a difference. So it's never too late to start doing something for your brain, but better yet, it's never too early to begin. Um, so I am the founder and creator of this program, uh, Ageless Grace, and I've done quite a few things with FAI, with Dan and with Cody, and Cody actually and I presented at the International Council on Active Aging uh, this past fall, and we presented a whole program on how neuroplasticity can be much more, neuroplasticity can be much more simple than you imagine that it would. Uh, the science behind it, the whole neuroscience field is very complex, and yet what we need to do to be able to change our brains, rewire them, and help them function more effectively is very simple. Uh, Cody actually even wrote an article in the Fitness Journal, the Idea Fitness Journal, that talked about the different kinds of things that we can do to include brain health in our personal training activities, and Ageless Grace was one of them. Um, he's also done a study on Ageless Grace which we'll talk about a little later in this presentation. But what's fascinating is you, I think you all know, or you 
wouldn't be on this call, that the baby boomer population is 25% of the entire population. It's huge. There are over 76 million people right now that were born between 1946 and 1964. And then, of course, that's going to keep happening. We have lots of people that are going to be 65 by 20. 30, for example, uh, uh, 79 million people are going to be 65 by then. So it's a very important thing to discuss how do we age and how can we do it more gracefully? How can we do it more functionally? And so used to the number one health concerns on our planet were heart disease and cancer. And that's no longer true. Now, everywhere in the world, everyone is concerned with losing brain function as we age. So that's why I'm saying out with the old and in with the new, because one of the things that we've discovered about brain health is that the way we fired neurons and created our functioning brain in the first place was by doing and trying and experimenting with new things, not doing the same old things over and over and over again, or doing the same old things, but in a new and different way. So that's where this topic came from. Because of the change that's happening in our world, not just in the United States, with, with an aging population that's not only aging, but living more frequently, more, more long, we have a longer lifespan, that we need to change our vocabulary. Neuroplasticity, neurons, neural pathways, those are words that you're now seeing frequently in magazine articles, on television, and blogs. I mean, you're seeing it um, everywhere and hearing it everywhere in every age-related communication that you might be involved with. So neuroplasticity is actually the ability of the brain to reorganize itself, to restructure itself by forming new neural connections. And basically a neural pathway is kind of like an information highway on the internet. It's the way information travels between your body parts that are needed to do certain kinds of movement and the brain itself, and then vice versa information or commands going from the brain to the body, and that creates neural pathways. And the more resilient your brain is and the more neural pathways you have, then the more cognitive reserve you have. Um, another word that's that's you're hearing a lot these days, in addition to neuroplasticity, is neurogenesis. And that's actually the process of creating new neurons, which are brain cells. And they um, are, most people think, well, oh, you can't do that past the mid-teens to the, the the early 20s, but that's actually not true. Under the right conditions, neurogenesis is happening all the time. New, new nerve cells, new brain cells are being created all the time. And there's forms of exercise and specific ways to exercise that cause this neurogenesis to take place. And we have, of course, more and more studies that are being done on this um, uh, topic so that people are understanding that no matter how old you are, you can actually change and rewire your brain. So um, those of you who have been doing training programs with FAI, Functional Aging Institute, know that the, the burning question that they ask is what's the most effective way to train older adults to maximize their ability to do the stuff they need to do, they like to do, and they want to do. And now what we're talking about today is adding on another part to that question, which is and support and improve their cognitive function at the same time to make all of this possible and pleasurable. So it actually turns out that being able to change your brain or help one of your clients or students change their brain is literally as simple as child's play. Right now, people around the globe are very concerned about being diagnosed with of various forms of cognitive decline, including Alzheimer's, dementia, Parkinson's. Um, There's so many different diagnoses now. And that's where this out with the old, in with the new comes in, because what we need to do is surprise our brain with new and different information. And I said it could be as simple as child's play. Well, it turns out that what we did when we were children was that we were playing at discovering new and different things. And somewhere in there, it got to be a popular myth that traditional brain games could actually 
improve the function of your brain and your overall brain quality and function. And this is actually a quote, a quote from a, a statement supplied by Cody Sype that claims promoting brain games are frequently exaggerated and at times misleading. There's actually very little evidence that playing any kind of brain game like Sudoku, crossword puzzles, uh, other word games, improve, improves underlying broad cognitive abilities or that it helps you to better navigate the realms or functions of daily life. Um, Cody also supplied this one, but there is a positive association between aerobic exercise and cardiovascular fitness that that we is that's pretty consistent with the fact that it has an effect on function, brain function, and on memory. And so. Um, Basically, what it boils down to is that the best exercise for the brain is not brain games, but physical exercise. So cognitive training combined with traditional fitness training is what is now causing us to incorporate good brain health along with good physical health, good health in our organs and in our systems of our bodies. So doing something physical is what's important. However, just being repetitive and, for example, being on a treadmill or a Stairmaster or jogging three miles every day is not new or different. It's repeating the same thing over and over and over. So when we say doing something physical affects brain function, we mean do something physical that you already know how to do but in a different way. Changing the sequences, changing the patterns, using your non and non-dominant, your dominant and non-dominant sides. Um, somehow doing something that you don't already know how to do, learning a new sport or a new activity or a new way of being a, a jogger or a runner or a biker. Combining two or more movements or activities in a new and different way. All these things cause your brain to fire neurons as it's attempting to figure out how to do this activity that's either new to the brain and the body or that they're, you're doing in a new and different way. And the brain immediately sort of perks up and lights up and says, ah, this is not the way I always do this. Let me see if I can figure out. And immediately it starts firing neurons. So Aristotle and Confucius actually knew this a long time ago. And Aristotle said, for the things we have to learn before we can do them, we learn by doing them. Fascinating. We always say that a lot. You may not have realized it comes from Aristotle. Learn by doing. And then Confucius said, tell me and I will forget. Show me and I may remember. Involve me. Have me physically do it and I will understand. So uh, this also came from Cody that the primary recommended strategies for affecting the brain at the same time that you're moving the body is Tai Chi, different kinds of sports, dance, and not just strictly dancing to the music, but maybe doing a combination or steps like ballroom dancing or choreography in a class, um, and then coordination and motor fitness. And um, um, a quote from Dr. John Rady, who wrote the book Spark, is that exercise Get your neurons ready. It prepares your neurons to connect, while mental stimulation allows your brain to capitalize on being ready. Uh, and this is a quote of, of, of Cody's. He says, to maximize, cogn maximize cognitive improvement, combine your physical exercise with cognitive challenges in a rich sensory motor environment that includes social interaction and a heaping dose of fun. And uh, Cody, of course, has taken the training in Ageless Grace in our program because if, if, if it's anything, it's fun. Let me tell you, you are always trying to do something that you don't know how. You're putting yourself in a place of taking risk and looking silly. Uh, you're putting your self in a place of laughing at yourself and so uh, there's a lot of laughter and fun along with figuring out how to cause your brain to ignite and use your body to do that. So just a tiny bit about me. I'll be 66 years uh, young. I like to say young instead of old in May and I'm passionate about movement exercise 
and I have been all my life. I was born with uh, spinal challenges and some pretty serious ones, and I used to have lots of injections in my spine when I was younger, and um, I learned at a very early age that the more I moved, the less pain I felt, and so pretty much I've been moving all my life, dancing, doing exercise, uh, marathons, triathlons, uh, walking, power walking. I've done so many different things. And I've discovered that not only do I feel better when I move, but my brain and my body function better overall in my daily life. My DNA is not fabulous. Uh, my mother was brilliant. She was a teacher. She read two or three books a week. She um, um, did crossword puzzles and games. She carried a book around with her. She did the London Times and the New York Times, and yet she struggled, as Dan said at the beginning, with uh, Alzheimer's and dementia. This is not a picture of my dad, by the way, although he looks like this. I just couldn't find a picture of my dad to put in here, but he was a sculptor and an artist, and somewhere in there he decided that he could sculpt his own body, and he became a bodybuilder, and no kidding, he was Mr. Tennessee, Mr. Dixie, Mr. Wisconsin, best back and abdominals and Mr. America and best back and abdominals and Mr. Universe. So, hey, uh, all the girls, my friends, used to love to come over to my house to study just to look at my dad. <laughs> um, and the cool thing was is that my dad stayed physically active up until literally a few weeks before he passed away. Two and a half months before he died, um, we uh, hiked 17 miles on the Appalachian Trail, and he was cognitively sharp and physically fit. So two different very genetics, which caused me uh, to be very interested not only in exercise and movement, which I'd been doing all my life, but to start to look at neuroscience. And I did 12 years of study. Um, my, my undergraduate degree is from the University of Tennessee in communication, which helped me be able to present this information in a way that um, everybody, I think, can understand it. But I also graduated from the Neuroscience Academy with Dr. Sarah McKay, and I did a lot of research um, as I was doing a graduate program in gerontology at Western Carolina University, and I also did pilot programs in a top 100 U.S. hospital, working with um, with patients, students, in all different departments of the hospital to discover what is something that everyone could do that would be good for them physically and address the physical functions that they need in daily life, the daily activities of life, and that would also uh, stimulate and activate the five functions of the brain, ideally uh, learning to fire new neurons and create neural pathways. And by the way, when I started this 12 years of study and research, there was almost no information on the internet, and there was not even the word neuroplasticity to be found. Uh, fascinating, huh? So my goal really has been to understand why do people age so differently, and more importantly, do we have any control over the way we age, both physically and mentally? Dr. Sarah McKay is one of the leading neuroscientists in the world today, and she compares the field of neuroscience with the study of astrophysics in the 17th century. Of course, at that time, everyone thought they knew everything there was to know about astrophysics, and as we know, uh, you know, 300 years later, we know a whole lot more, and things are not at all what we thought they were. So rapid new discoveries are being made about the brain and how it functions, literally, Every week, there's like a new study, a new report, a new paper that's coming out. And most of the neuroscientists agree that the best exercise for the brain is actually physical exercise. And I think that's good news to everyone who's on this webinar. So simply playing word games, numbers, and puzzles does not delay cognitive decline because it only stimulates some of the functions of the brain. And, and basically what it does is it makes you better at numbers and puzzles. Um, traditional repetitive exercise does not delay cognitive decline either. It can delay cognitive decline, it can improve brain function, and it can stimulate all the functions of the brain if it's done in a way that engages the brain in what the body's doing. It's very easy to be on a treadmill, for example, or to be running or jogging and literally shut your brain off, put on some headsets or earphones, and, and think about something completely different than what you're actually physically doing. And so what they've discovered is that really thinking about what you're doing and figuring out how the best and most efficient way to do it is what is stimulating the brain as you're exercising. So what you have to do is activate neuroplasticity 
which then means you can change the form and function of your brain and your central nervous system, especially when you're doing physical exercise in a new way or a different way. So that's another thing we need to change when we say out with the old and in with the new is we need to change our way of thinking to a form of consciously choosing to do something physical in a new or different way in order to engage all the functions of the brain. I mean, a real simple um, illustration of that would be as if you always brush your teeth with your right hand, switching to the left hand. It's a physical activity, a simple one that's really only working one arm. But it is, in fact, causing your brain to engage in a different way than doing it the way that you know how to do very well already. Doing these kinds of conscious choices in your physical activity can directly affect the quality of the rest of your life and, of course, the rest of the life of your clients and, and students, regardless of age, as I mentioned at the beginning. One of the things that neuroscientists have dis discovered over the last 10 to 15 years is what the primary purpose of the brain is. And we, I'm sure, have, have know that the brain can be creative and it can plan and it can be inventive and it can do all these incredible things. But its primary purpose is actually to control movement of the body. That's fascinating um, because that means that not only does the brain control movement of the body, but when our body moves, it's affecting the brain. So from the day you were born until your mid-teens or maybe even early 20s, you were discovering how to do physical activities through trial and error, and you were firing neurons as you did it and creating neural pathways. You were learning to walk, hop, skip, run, play hide and roll go see, roller skate, maybe play on a team, which is, involves a lot of strategy, or ride a bicycle, which is sequential um, uh, movement. And you were probably not being asked by your mother to go outside and fire a few neurons. Instead, you were going outside to play, and every time you were playing, you were firing neurons and developing neural pathways that deliver messages between your brain and your body. So play is a big key to this. And by play, I don't just mean traditional play games. I mean, it doesn't mean that you have to go out and play hopscotch or, or play softball, although those are great things, especially if you don't know how to do them very well, because your brain will have to figure them out. But I'm talking about a playful attitude of discovery and experimentation with your physical movement so that you're not doing it the same way all the time. I've alluded two or three times to the primary functions of the brain, and um, for some of you have heard me speak before and know that I like to use baseball to describe the five primary functions of the brain. Um, they, you ideally need to stimulate all of those primary functions every single day in order to fire neurons, develop neural pathways, and have all of the brain affected. That's why crossword puzzles and Sudoku don't work. They affect maybe the analytical or the memory part of the brain, but they don't affect the strategic planning part of the brain or the kinesthetic learning part of the brain or creativity and imagination. And all of that needs to light up every day, not very long, but at least every day, for the brain to be healthy. Again, like brushing your teeth would mean brush all of your teeth. Don't just brush the ones in the front. So that's the same way we want to develop our brain, all of it fully and completely. So let's talk about these five primary functions of the brain. If you Google this and look it up, you will see that there are many descriptions of what I'm calling strategic planning. But basically what this means is how your brain is helping your body figure out how to get from point A to B to C. I'm not talking about strategically planning your retirement. I'm talking about you strategically planning, well, gee, if I want to get here physically, if I want to slide in home, or if I want to um, steal a base, or if I want to bunt, what do I have to do with my body to organize itself right now for the good of the game, for the best results? Do I hit a bunt? Do I hit a line drive? Do I walk? And that is a form of strategic planning and causing your body to quickly communicate with your brain and your brain to communicate with your body to get from point A to B to C to D or wherever you need to go. Uh, the next was, um, oops, I think I clicked two. I need to go back here. Um, memory and recall. And memory and recall, let's see if I can make it go back. Oops, it's not wanting to go back. 
well, I'm just going to tell you what this is. Memory and recall is literally uh, remembering the physical experience or sensation or feeling of some activity that you've done before. And many times we think that, oh, if I remember someone's phone number, that's not a physical activity. Activity. Well, it probably is because the way you're remembering it is how you dialed it on your cell phone or how you punched the numbers in or um, uh, maybe back in the day how you dialed the phone with your finger. Wow, anybody remember doing that? And recall is knowing, recalling what your body remembers about an activity, even though it may never have done it before. So, for example, I've never played a trombone, uh, but I have a good idea of how to do that because I've seen it on television or I've seen it at the symphony. So same thing with baseball. I can remember if I've ever connected the ball and the bat, I can remember how that feels in my body that crack, that sound of the ball in the back connecting. But if I have never done that, I have watched baseball on TV or I've seen someone like Babe Ruth or um, uh, do that same thing, Mickey Mantle on TV that connected the ball in the back. I remember the sound of it. I remember seeing how their body moved. And so I have a good recall of what it feels like to hit the ball with the bat. The next one's analytical thinking, and it's breaking down the parts or components of an activity. Again, physical activity. So in baseball, you could pitch or bat or catch or field or slide in home, or maybe you're one of the people who's cheering from the stands, and that's a physical activity. It's an analytical way of looking at the game of baseball. What are all the parts or components? components that I could choose to do, and maybe you do several of them, or two of them, or three of them. Creativity and imagination means attempting to do something physical in a new or different way, and actually seeing in your mind's eye an image of yourself doing this before you try it. So a simple example in baseball would be if you normally bat right-handed, practice batting lefty instead of right, and then use imagery. Imagine yourself hitting the ball out of the park, over the wall. Imagine where you want it to go. There's been lots of research on imagination and action or movement and, and imagination and how imagining yourself doing something over and over, even before you've tried it physically, can vastly improve the way that you do it. And that, of course, is a brain activity. The last one's kinesthetic learning, and that is what we've actually done all of our lives, certainly from the time that we were born up until we were in our mid-teens to late 20, early 20s. We were trying something physically first while our brain was observing what we were doing it and making us more efficient. And there's that Confucius quote of learning by doing. So I didn't take a course in baseball ever in my life. I just went out into the front field in my house in Raccoon Valley, Tennessee, where I'm from, and I joined the game, and I grabbed a bat, and I didn't know what I was doing at first, but I got better with practice. And so that's kinesthetic learning. And that's actually, again, how we learn best, and that is what stimulates the brain best. Try it. And then your brain is going to get involved right away and say, aha, something new. Let's see if I can figure out how you can do this more effectively. So if you put the first letter of each one of those functions together, strategic planning, memory and recall, analytical thinking, creativity and imagination, and kinesthetic learning, um, it makes the acronym SMACK. It's an easy way to remember it. And it's close to the sound, that crackling, popping, smacking sound uh, that neurons make when they're firing. So it's an easy way for you to remember, gee, am I activating all five functions of my brain and the brains of my clients when I'm working with them? So you improve through practice. Of course, after swinging the bat a hundred different ways and firing thousands of neurons, I got better because the messages start to travel more and more quickly along the neural pathways uh, as you practice something more and more. And then you get really good at it or you decide that this activity is not for you and you don't do it anymore. So the reason that people thought or scientists thought that brains couldn't change past the late teens to 20s is because people were starting to do the things they liked best and that they were very good at. And they weren't trying new things. They were getting better and better at the same thing or same two or three things. And so the brain appeared as if it was 
not rewiring or firing new neurons or cre creating new neural pathways. And then they started looking at people who did things like uh, took up gymnastics at the age of 76 and became a champion and they looked at their brains or someone that learned to play um, a sport or a sporting activity when they were 50 or 60 instead of just when they were kids. So another thing we want to change when we talk about out with the old and in with the new is our way of playing. We stimulated neuroplasticity originally by physically learning and we didn't even realize we were doing it. So physical movement and activity is what developed our brains in the first place. Um, many of you may have read the book, The Brain That Changes Itself. It was one of the first big uh, bestsellers on the brain and how it can rewire and change regardless of our age. And it's still a very poignant and fabulous book written by Dr. Norman Deutsch, who's written two or three since then. And what he says is that we have to learn new things in order to actually feel as if we're alive. When we learn, though, we're altering genes in our neurons, and that can literally change our brain. So we want to continue to fire our neurons the way we did as a child. And the way we want to do that is by playing, by being creative, by being imaginative, by taking risks, by being brave, by not worrying about how it looks, by trying something new and experimenting. And by all of these, I'm relating this to movement. How can I do all of these things in my movement or in my personal training or in my personal training programs that I'm designing for my clients and working with them. How can I incorporate these things so that they are be willing to not worry about how it looks or try something new or be imaginative or creative and experiment with new ways of moving. So as I said before, neuroscientists now know that we can help change the brains of our clients and ourselves no matter how old they are. So what we're doing is we're restoring, maintaining, and developing new neural pathways as we're playing these games and experimenting with new ways to do something we don't know how to do or to do something we already know how to do differently. Literally, 10 minutes of this kind of play, of figuring out something new and uh, playing with the idea of how can I do this with my left foot instead of my right hand? How could I do this with my left foot and my right hand at the same time? How could I incorporate my lower body to do something I normally do with my upper body? This kind of play can stimulate all five brain functions through physical activity. Uh, and of course, you know, some clients don't actually like to work out. I like to work out. Probably a lot of you on this webinar like to work out, but some clients don't. And so the concept of playing uh, can be more fun than working out. Another thing that Dr. Deutsch said and discovered is that by looking at brain scans, uh, they found some fascinating inf information that imagining an act and doing it are not as different as they sound from a neuroscientific point of view. Brain scans show us that action and imagination light up most or many of the same parts of the brain. Fascinating. So ideally, if we can do that activity and and imagine it at the same time that we're doing it, we're getting sort of a double whammy, a double benefit of brain health as we do it. So uh, Cody Seip, uh, who's a partner with Dan in the Functional Aging Institute, and some colleagues of his at Harding University did a physical and cognitive evaluation of uh, Ageless Grace. That's the neuroplasticity exercise program that they used uh, for this study. And what they wanted to do was evaluate the short-term effects of this brain or cognition program on physical and cognitive function in elderly people or older people who are non-demented. They didn't have signs of memory loss or uh, cognition decline. Uh, they had um, they designed and did pre-post testing with a single group, and they did 27 sessions of Ageless Grace, each one an hour long, uh, for nine weeks. And then they had them uh, do the program at home on their own for 10 or 15 minutes a day. And the, they did assessments. There was physical performance battery, um, patient-specific functional scale, um, up and go, computerized dynamic posturography, 
They did a lot of tests that were physical. Then cognitively, they used the Montreal Cognitive Assessment. Um, they did a digit span forward and backward, and they did a trail making test A and B. And um, what they discovered uh, with these, oh, and the subjects that they used, they were um, age 85 and up, or 74 to 96, when 85 was average. And they were 12 females and five males, and there were 14 um, that reported no falls, none at all, during this time period. All subjects were residents in the independent wing of a local retirement facility, and they had no injuries or falls during the entire course of the duration of the program. And of course, the program is done, the Age of Grace program is done seated. But I'd like to clarify to all of you who are listening that we don't do it seated because it's for people who are frail or have poor balance or can't stand. We do it seated because if I ask you to pretend you're playing baseball while you're sitting in a chair or pretend that you're dribbling a soccer ball down the field while you're sitting in a chair, your brain engages immediately. So the idea is to do it in a chair so that the brain is involved specifically and immediately with the things that we're doing. Now, doing it in a chair also engages your core muscles, your uh, organs. It helps with the energy centers of your body. It activates the systems of your body. There are lots of good reasons for sitting down, at least sometimes, in your training program. And the other thing that it does is that it is adaptable, and that's the last reason to people who do have poor balance or who uh, have frail or who are recovering from some sort of injury. So the results that uh, that Cody and his colleagues found, 91% uh, were compliant, to, came to the classes, and um, they uh, – Four decreased slightly, four stayed the same, eight improved, and one did not retest. That's a wonderful, significant result uh, for a short-term study with a small group. And so because of that, um, we're, we're seeing in only nine weeks and, and those uh, few classes that they did, three classes a week, that there was improvement in that many people in their brain function and in their physical function. And so there's sufficient evidence, um, and Cody is, is and his colleagues are looking into um, a larger and longer study and uh, greater funding so that they can have a bigger program. So um, I would like to give you these three or four ideas where you can't see me, but I'd like to give you three or four ideas uh, about some physical activities that are part of the Ageless Grace program that will help you understand how we can do certain things that can cause us to be more functional and alert and focused. So uh, I, I already mentioned this, that we're not seated due to age or balance or fragility, but I want you to be doing this hopefully from a seated position for right now because I want you to see how fascinating it is to be in a chair and figure out how to do activities that you probably know how to do already standing. So the first one's team fit, and we could choose any sport and pretend to play it in your chair. So needless to say, with baseball, for example, you could kind of sit sideways in your chair with at least one foot flat on the floor, and you could pretend to swing the bat uh, at the ball. And you want to really put all of your energy and attention on swinging your bat at that ball the same way you would as if you were playing a real game. And some of you may have played baseball before. Some of you may have not played very much, or some of you may not have played at all. But but imagine swinging that bat several times over and over and hitting that ball and imagine hitting it out of the ballpark and then immediately turn in your chair and imagine swinging with the other hand and hitting the ball and you're warming up and swinging repeatedly several times. Then another thing you could do in baseball is run. Once you hit the ball, you have to run, right? So run in your chair. Get your feet going as fast as you can. Get your arms going as fast as you can. And really run the way you would if you were running from home plate to first base. And, of course, another thing you could do in baseball is you could pitch. So wind up and pitch. And imagine, if you've never done it before yourself, how a pitcher lifts the leg and really puts their whole body into it and their back and throw that ball two or three times over the plate with one hand 
And then when you finish doing that, switch and go to the other side and throw it with the other hand. Now, needless to say, I could go on and on here and we could spend several minutes uh, doing just baseball. But there are so many sports that you could imagine doing. And what's really fun is to imagine doing some of the ones that you really have not done before. You know, maybe you've never surfed or maybe you've never done downhill skiing. Imagine how to do it and do it from a chair uh, in order to let your body connect with your brain and your brain figure out how to do it. Another very simple exercise, which you can do best seated, again, because we're going to use our legs and our feet, not just uh, our arms and hands, is called spelling bee. And instead of using a pen or a pencil, you spell with your, your body. Um, and we're going to spell with different parts of the body. So you can also spell in any language. You can print capital letters or upper and lower case. You could do it in cursive. You could spell letter by letter or you could spell backwards. It's a fun thing to do. There was a wonderful PBS series on the brain uh, not long ago and they had very bright children spelling words backwards and they were giving them more and more difficult words to spell backwards but they were just spelling them verbally like you would be in a traditional spelling bee. I want you to spell the initials F-A-I for Functional Aging Institute and I want you to start and make a capital printed letter F with your elbow on one side and draw it several times. So draw an F with your elbow several times and make it as large as you can. And then I'd like you to try it with the other elbow and draw it several times and make an F with that other elbow. And then just for fun, see if you can draw that F backwards so it's facing the other direction with that elbow. Draw it backwards. And then for fun with both elbows, draw it backwards two or three times. And then we're going to move on to the letter A, and you're going to do that with your foot. Extend your foot out in front of you and draw a large capital letter A, printed block letter, and draw it several times, capital A, with one of your feet in the air out in front of you. So you're going to really have to use your hip flexors, your knees, your ankles, your abdominal control. Big letter A several times, and then switch and draw a big letter A with the other foot. Big letter A with that foot in the air several times. Be as precise as you can. Make it as large as you can. And then here's one of my favorites. We're going to make the letter I with your belly button. Up and down, belly button. So you're kind of holding on to your chair. You're not really standing up. You're just lifting up out of your chair and drawing that letter I several times with your belly button. Now, I chose a short one on purpose, uh, but the reality is you could have, as I said, spelled any word. It could be a long word, a short word. You could spell different kinds of words with your different body parts. So, for example, if I said, gee, I'm going to spell words of things that are sports, then with one hand I might write the word baseball in cursive, and then I would write it with the other hand in the air, and then I might write the word surf with my knee, and then and write surf with the other knee and then I might write the word um, ping pong with my nose in the air and I, I might work, write the word um, badminton which is a nice long word with my tailbone while I'm sitting. So the whole idea is to use as much of the body as possible and spell different words. Now here's a really fun one that no one can do. You're not even supposed to be able to do it and that's the point. Remember I said you could do activities to stimulate brain function by doing something you know how to do differently. So most of you knew how to do those sports. Uh, most of you know how to spell, but we were doing it differently. But most of you are not going to be able to draw circles, lines, and triangles at the same time with different parts of the body. So start to draw a circle in the air with your hand. Just draw a circle in the air. And after you get that circle going, see if you can draw a triangle with your opposite foot in the air. So your hand on one side is drawing a circle and your foot is drawing a triangle. And I can't hear you, of course, but I bet you're giggling uh, and laughing by now. Don't stop trying this because while you're trying it, neurons are firing. While if you stop, then they're not firing. So you want them to fire while you're trying to figure out how to make a circle with one hand and a triangle with the opposite foot. And then use your other hand to draw a horizontal line. Oh my gosh! Triangle foot, horizontal line, one hand, circle, other hand, and hopefully you're, you're laughing at yourself by now. Keep trying, don't stop, keep trying, don't stop. 
And what you would now do is switch to the other side and you or your client would make the circle with the opposite hand, the line with the opposite hand, and draw the triangle with the opposite foot. Now you can mix those patterns up. I mean, if, if you can't do two of them together, good. That's enough. You don't have to add a third one because the idea is to do something that you can't do. <coughs> Excuse me. Or attempt to do something that you can't do. It's really fun. You, you could draw a triangle with your nose and a circle with your belly button. You could uh, use any body part to make any of these shapes. And it's stimulating neuroplasticity by doing something you don't know how to do. Now, body math is a counting game, and it teaches us to respond and react and recover, both physically and mentally, which is wonderful for mitigating falls, accidents, unexpected surprises. And so literally what you do, and, and I do all these exercises to music. It, I play one song. And I do one exercise with myself or with my students because the music gives me a beat and a rhythm to follow, which adds one more layer to my brain health and my cognitive function. Um, so you tap your hand and foot to the beat of the music. So you're counting out loud at the same time. So on my right hand and my right foot, I might be just tapping the floor and tapping my hand in the air and saying one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Then I switch to the other side, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And you go back and forth from the right side to the left. Randomly, you clap on a certain number. So you might say, let's clap on three, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And then the next time you might clap on seven or six or two and seven. And it gets very confusing. And yet it's teaching you to respond, react and recover very quickly to something unexpected. You don't know what's coming next. Uh, so it's a wonderful pattern. And you can use this in a lot of different ways. Certainly sitting down, you can use it. But you can use this um, ability to clap on different numbers, step on different numbers, tap the top of your head on a different number, uh, count in different patterns, four on each side. Groups of eight work really well if you're working with music because most music does have an eight beat count. Um, and that means that you can then work in sections or groups of numbers of four and two as well. And it's really fun to do this. People are always laughing. So that's just a few ideas. So what this does when we're pretending to play sports or imagining that we're seeing the word or the letter that we're writing in the air or creating shapes in the air and seeing them is our brain is strategizing, using our memory and recall, analyzing its, its being creative and imaginative, and it's causing us to figure it out with the body first or kinesthetically. So as simple as those little things were, they were activating all five of your primary brain functions. And this is something that you can incorporate in your personal training. How do I activate those five, train, uh, five brain functions in new and creative ways of doing what I've always done. So some simple ideas are different stepping patterns that change. And, and don't be afraid to change quickly. Like when I'm doing that body math counting, like I will change the number every time I come back to the right hand or every other time. Uh, or I'll start with the left hand and switch to the right. Or I'll count from one to four on one side and five to eight on the other. Or one to three on one side and four to eight on the other. So different stepping patterns or counting patterns. Patterns. Cross body moves, um, which we've discovered causes the neurons to fire. Basically, it's, it's, it's lighting up parts of the brain across the corpus callosum in the center of the brain. Alternating your hands or legs with different counting patterns, like I was just mentioning. Doing traditional training backwards or in a different order or alternating the training. Untraditional cross training. Uh, there are many daily life choices that you and your clients can incorporate into literally what they do every day. If they knit or sew, how can they do that and change hands and do it with the opposite hand? Fascinating brain work. Maybe they play tennis or some other sport. So if they play tennis, try serving on the other side. Maybe not in the middle of a doubles game when your, your partner is going to be really upset with you. But when you're practicing, when you're warming up, see if you can serve with the other hand. Learn to juggle. There's some great 
uh, videos on uh, YouTube that you can watch to learn how to do just about anything you might want to do. And learning something new physically is working out your brain. Driving or walking a different route to places that you go every day or every week. If you always turn right and then left, go to the coffee shop, well, experiment with turning left and going around the block and parking across the street because figuring out a new way of driving or walking or navigating is also physical. You are actually moving and driving and making physical decisions as you drive or walk. Taking up a new sport is a wonderful thing to do, uh, a new sport or a new hobby. Obviously, when you get really good at it, then you're not firing as many neurons in the same way and affecting all five functions of the brain. You're still affecting the brain, but just not all five functions. Um, I put a little picture here of some London cab drivers because they uh, have a higher than average cognitive function. And I'm sure you can deduce why that is, because every time someone gets in their cab, they don't know where they're going to go next and they have to navigate to a different place from a different place. And more importantly, the streets in London are quite old, much more than in America where we commonly have a grid system. And so they have to weave in and out and around and uh, recall what street leads into what street. And if there's any traffic, which there is in London, or if the Queen's out that day or something's closed off, then they have to figure out an alternative route. And their cognitive function is much higher than average. So I call all these things that we're doing taking your daily pill. Because as you all know, if you work with um, seniors and older adults, they tend to have pills for everything because their doctor prescribes them and our insurance companies pay for them. And so uh, I say this is a pill that you're going to really enjoy and there's no bad adverse side effects. Uh, you don't need a doctor's prescription and you're going to feel better almost immediately. And it's play instead of living limited. So if you play a few of these simple games every day, uh, you can improve your brain and body skills and live an ageless uh, and more graceful and happier life. Playing should be part of our days. George Bernard Shaw said, we don't stop playing because we grow old. We grow old because we stop playing. Here, here, he knew what he was talking about. So a challenge for you and your clients. After this webinar, play 10 minutes a day every day and see what new ideas you can come up with. Try some things you've never done before or do something that you know how to do very well differently. And I think you'll see that changing your brain can be as simple as child's play. And it's something you can easily incorporate into the types of training patterns and exercises that you're doing now for yourself or for your clients. Uh, the last thing that I have on the screen, which you might want to make a copy of or take a screenshot if you have uh, one or, or your cell phone nearby, is we have a special Functional Aging Institute link to the Ageless Grace Brain Health Training. It's a 14-hour hands-on certification. Uh, we, we, are, we do not do it online for many reasons, uh, but we have trainings all over the country every weekend, and we have them all over the world, sometimes during the week, but most of them are on a Saturday and Sunday or a Friday and Saturday. Um, and you will get, if you use this FAI link, you'll get $20 off of your training, which includes a three DVD set, um, uh, of the 21 different exercises that we teach you, the playbook, um, and the flashcards for personal practice for yourself or with your clients. And so this is the, the link, agelessgrace.com slash ref slash three slash. Um, and then the code that you use down at the bottom is FAI, pretty easy to remember, and that gives you your $20 off discount. So uh, I think some of you might like to add this to your resume, and um, it's a nice thing to have. Even if you don't use it a lot, it's nice knowledge and information to have so that you uh, can explain to your clients that you do know how to um, uh, include brain function in what you're doing. So I'm thinking that, Cody, uh, that Dan is going to open this up now to questions. I know we don't have a lot more time, but we have a little more time if someone has questions. Yes, yes. Pop your questions in now because uh, we probably only have about 10 minutes. Um, though we'll, we'll probably hang around as long as you're willing to hang around, Denise. So that was sure. uh, that was some fun stuff. And I, I love the, uh, the concept of just trying to get people to play 10 minutes a day. That's great. Exactly. Um... um 
Oh, just just real quick. Uh, she's not here anymore, but Deborah Nichols uh, said hello and raised her hand waving at you. Oh, okay, she did that great. Early, early on, but I didn't want to disrupt you. Um, Rebecca says uh, she had to leave early. She might still be here. I don't notice that she's left. What a spectacular webinar. Thank you. We'll put all of what you shared to immediate use. Big smiley face. Good. Good. Good stuff there. So, so questions, folks, if you have questions. Um, Carrie is asking, so are all the exercises in the program done in the seated position? They are done in the seated position, but that does not mean that they're not adaptable to other positions. Um, part of the reason we do that is because a lot of, of training is done, of course, standing or moving or using equipment or on machines. And so this is something when they sit down immediately, if they incorporate two or three of these exercises in with other personal training things that you're doing, they immediately have to figure out how do I do this sitting down and, and do I need to hold on to the arms of a chair or do I need to hold on to the seat or the bench that I'm sitting on? And so it, they are designed to be done seated, but that does not mean that they're not adaptable to uh, other ways. The, the one thing about being seated also is obviously you can't lift both feet off the floor if you're standing up or if you can, I'm very impressed. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but sitting down, you can raise one leg, you can lift it, you can put it over the side of the chair, you can put it in the air, you can put it over the arm, you can use your arm and legs together at the same time for all different kinds of things. It's a little bit, say, like doing a, a crunch on a, on a, on a slant board or something like that. You can do all these kinds of things in a chair and figure out how to do them, and it and it makes it quite frankly not only more mentally challenging, but it's more physically challenging because it's not something most clients do. Okay, perfect. Um, oh, the questions are coming in fast. Hold on, <laughs> the screen's <laughs> moving in front of my eyes. Um, hi, Denise. Karen Hasley here. Um, I'm not sure if it's Hasley or Hazley. Please let Hazley. people know we will have three trainers at the FAI Summit in June. Oh, yes. I'm glad she put that out there. Um, we will have three of our Ageless Grace trainers who will have a, a table or a booth display at the um, uh, FAI Summit in June. So I'm hoping all of you will, if you've not already signed up and registered already to go to the FAI Summit, that you will go. I went last year and was one of the presenters, and it was a wonderful experience. I learned so much from all the people that were there, and I learned a lot you know, networking with other people uh, who were attending. And so um, you'll get to meet and interact with, with three of our trainers there at the uh, FAI Summit. Thanks for that, Karen. Um, Carrie, follow-up question to the seated, um, is asking about eyes closed. Um, do you do, I, I think just in general, like, you know, what what portion of it is eyes closed, not eyes closed? I recommend to everyone that they do it with their eyes open, but if they feel more comfortable doing some of it with their eyes closed, they're welcome to do it. Um, it, it stimulates the brain in a different way to be imagining what you're seeing, what you're doing with your eyes open than it does with your eyes closed. And so I, I, ask people, to, it's pretty vigorous by the way, you saw what we were doing um, just in those quick little examples and in a class for example we do uh, 45 minutes to an hour one right after another so we're doing a lot of physical movement and it's best for them to have their eyes open for safety reasons as well so that they don't get disoriented although when you're sitting down your, your um, derriere knows where parallel to the floor is, it knows where the horizon line is so the, we've never <laughs> ever had anyone uh, fall out of a chair or lose their balance so much that they fall out of a chair. So eyes open or closed would work, but I recommend open. All right. Stacy's asking um, about any studies done with those already in a state of dementia. Um, not specifically on ageless grace. However, there have been hundreds of studies done that show that dementia patients respond and react to physical exercise and that it's very good for them. And unfortunately, a lot of centers and residential um, centers where memory care 
people are placed um, don't have physical activity for the memory care because they think they won't respond or react to it, but they do. We Many Ageless Grace teachers are teaching the Ageless Grace um, program to people with moderate to advanced decline in cognition with great results. I personally teach one, um, I teach a class to people with moderate to advanced decline. And quite frankly, before they come into class and, and after they leave at some point in time, they just sit and they don't really respond. They look, they stare, they're very non-responsive and non-interactive. But in Ageless Grace class, when I ask them to do things that they know from their childhood, because many of you know that people with, with Alzheimer's and dementia commonly have long-term memory, even though they don't have short-term memory. And if I ask them to throw a baseball or pretend they're climbing a tree or uh, pretend they're in a swing and swing and pump in the in the chair it's amazing how every person in the room responds and reacts to that so they get their exercise that way and they're also getting some brain um, brain help with it so there are studies that show exercise but we haven't done a specific one that shows how ageless grace affects dementia but there are lots of studies that show movement and imagination do affect dementia uh, Carol asks, where is the June Summit? I think I can take that one. Um, just check out FunctionalAgingSummit.com. It is in Orlando, June 15th and 16th. So FunctionalAgingSummit.com, you can get all the information to get registered. Again, it's June 15th and 16th in Orlando. Uh, Trudy says, wonderful session. We'll be using more of the suggestions in training. Um, Donna is asking about uh, commands. Is using right and left commands very useful? People struggle with that, I've noticed, uh, when moving aerobically or for yoga. So just wondering um, what you think is useful for commands. That's a great question because what I have discovered as I was developing Ageless Grace, that using right and left commands um, are not nearly as good as using a, a point of attention in the room. So for example, in the room where I teach my advanced de cognitive decline students, one wall is covered to their left with windows and one wall to their right has many, many doors in it that go out into the hall. And so I commonly say, everybody take your hand closest to the window and do something or take your leg closest to the window. And then I'll say, or take your hand closest to the doors because that causes their imagination and attention and brain to once again be engaged as opposed to just the memory function trying to remember which is right and which is left which most people memorized more than they did embodied. All right. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, that looks like the last of the questions. So um, I'm going to cut it off at that point since we're four minutes past the hour. For those of you listening on the, on the replay or watching the recording of this in our membership area, um, if they want to reach out to you, Denise, with questions, where's the best place for them to go? Is it just to your website? The website is great, um, but you can also send questions to info, I-N-F-O, at agelessgrace.com. Okay, awesome. So so either hop on the website, agelessgrace.com, or shoot them an email, info at agelessgrace.com, and they'll get back to you right away. Right. So. And um, if you use your FAI link that I gave you, that link will take you immediately to the page that shows you all the trainings going on in the world. Ageless Grace, we have 20, almost 2,500 certified Ageless Grace educators at this point, and they're in all 50 states teaching, and they're in 23 other countries. Um, so it's, it's, you can see that the, the, Millions of baby boomers that there are in the world, especially, um, are great for your business if you're a personal trainer or a fitness instructor. And they are out there and they're wanting something. And that's why this has taken off all over the world, not just in the United States. That, that is fantastic. I think, I think we're at 48 out of 50 states and we've been begging people in those yes. last two states. So, yes, so that's come great. on. That's great. Right. All right. Well, thanks so much for your time, Denise, and uh, highly, highly encourage people check out Ageless Grace. Thanks again.